Father, this morning we praise you because you deserve our praise. You deserve our love, our adoration, and our worship because you have loved us and created us and you have redeemed us through the power of Jesus Christ. And Lord, this morning our prayer is that you really would heal our hearts, that you would break us and cleanse us and renew us and bring us to that place where we can live as you intended, as victorious sons and daughters of the living God. And so we invite you now to speak into our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Philippians uh, chapter 4. We're going to be wrapping up our series, A Letter to Friends, today. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, we're going to pick up in verse 10. If you don't have a Bible with you, that is okay. Just grab one uh, of the Bibles in the pews around you. Look just like this one. Turn to page 1,250. And you will find Philippians chapter 4. Uh, and by the way, if you need a Bible, we invite you to take one of these with you when you go. Uh, if you want to read the Word of God and you don't have a Bible, then please let this be our gift to you. We know that the Bible can change your life as you read it and incorporate it into your life. Hey, while you're finding Philippians chapter 4, what is your absolute favorite food? You know, that one you never get tired of, that you always want more of. And I don't want you to tell me, I want you to tell your neighbor. So ready, set, go. What do you love to eat? You know, I really enjoy the fact that uh, you guys are having conversations with one-word answers. You know, one, two, three-word answers may be the most, and I, I don't know if you guys are sharing recipes or you're making lunch plans or what. You see, I love hamburgers, okay? I, I just, uh, I admit it, I like fast food burgers, I like fancy burgers, I like homemade burgers, I love hamburgers. I never get tired of eating hamburgers. I can eat them for breakfast, I can eat them for lunch, I can eat them for dinner, I can have them as snacks. Uh, I, just, I just like burgers. And in fact, now that I mention it, I'm kind of craving a burger right now. <laughs> ah, so, uh, so when I get done with, uh, you know, preaching today, with the services today, I think I'm going to have me a hamburger, but problem is we don't have any ingredients at home. So I'll run by the store on the way home, and I'll pick up some dog food and some cooking oil, maybe some ice cream and pickles uh, and Jello, right? Because that goes with everything. Am I going to be able to get what I want? Will, will I satisfy my craving? Does that even make sense? You see, in our lives, we have a similar problem. The problem is this. We desire to be contented and joyful followers of Jesus, but we pursue worldly means to get there. We want to be those joyful, contented uh, worshipers of Christ uh, who is, he's changed our life and we're living it in, and we're living in that contentment, but we're buying the wrong ingredients for our lives. And so we're not satisfied. I want you to hear the words of the Apostle Paul to his friend as he wraps up this book of Philippians, this letter that he wrote to them. And I want you to hear what he says. Beginning in verse 10, he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, Paul shares, uh, real simply, a couple of things. Notice in verse 11, he says, For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He says, I know how to be content. It's like there's sounds going off in our heads that, that uh, <laughs> they just go, yes, I want contentment. And in verse 12, he says, I have learned the secret. 
the secret of being content. He goes, look, I've learned this. It's kind of like the secret recipe for the best ever. And in verse 13, he tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do this. So I want you to catch this. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ today, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, personal, and that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then understand you can be content. You can live a life of contentment and joy. It is possible because of Jesus. It's not possible because we're brilliant. It's not possible because we're good people. It's possible because Jesus gives us the strength to do it. To get there is possible, but it isn't easy. And it begins with a question. And here's the question. What do you want more of? What do you want more of? Uh, Now, we're in a church, so it's really easy to give the church answers, you know, and yeah, I want want the Bible more. I want Jesus more. I want God more. God. But, But I really want you to examine your heart and your desires and figure out what it is that your life is craving because the cravings of our life drive our actions. The things that we really desire are what drive us. Uh, now, Friday night, I was in Tucson. I was at a pastor's and wives retreat. There was a bunch of us that went. And, uh, and after dinner, of course, because it's you know, something special, I want dessert. And, uh, and, and so I was with, uh, some of you know Pastor Sean, used to be co-pastor here. He was with us. He's in Tucson now. So he took us to this place called Frost. I highly recommend it, by the way. If you're in Tucson and you want to sin and sweetness, then find this place called Frost. And so it's a gelato shop. And uh, if we go in there, gelato is just, you know, uh, more expensive ice cream. And so uh, we go in there, and, and they have three sizes. They have the little petite size. They have the medium. They have the large, which to me when I looked at it was not large enough. And I'm like, where's the oh my goodness glutton size? Because that's what <laughs> I want. Uh, and so I got the large and, and they put, you know, three kinds of deliciousness in there. And we're, we're outside standing in a group. Just the weather was nice. We're eating, you know, gelato. And, and, you know, getting close to being done, people are like, oh, I'm so full. I'm so stuffed. I can't finish this. And honestly, I'm thinking I could eat another one of these. <laughs> this was so good. I want more of it. And I said that to Marilla. I said, I, you know what? Honestly, I could eat another one. She goes, you're not going to go back in there and get another one, are you? And I go, no, but I want to. Okay, I have, I'm having some self-control here. I'm just saying if they had one of those in Havasu, I would sin horribly. What do you want more of? Now, we're laughing because that's a superficial, physical hunger that, you know, uh, I had enough self-control to say no to. But do you really want more Jesus? Or do you want more money and fame and power and success? Do you really want more joy or do you want more activities and entertainment and maybe somebody, a person who will make you happy? Do you really want to trust in God more or do you want to rely on yourself and work harder and and your pride to get it done? What do you want more of? Think about it. In our culture, we talk about the things we want very, very often and very openly. As a culture, we want to live longer, so we focus on health and nutrition and safety. You know, we got to bubble wrap our kids and make sure that nothing is ever dangerous around them. And, and, you know, did you hear about the teachers that confiscated Oreos at school lunch because they weren't healthy? Yeah, that's that's cause for revolution right there. (laughs) Don't take my Oreos. See, we want to live longer, and yet God never challenges us to live longer. He challenges us to live better. To live well. We want more money and more stuff. You know, we spiritualize it. We call them blessings, right? We want more blessings. God's blessed us so much. We're looking at all the stuff we have. We've got to build garages for our blessings. And, and we want more. And yet God never tells us to accumulate more. He challenges us to give more. We want to be important. We want recognition and titles and plaques with our names on it. So we say, I'm important. See, I've done something. And yet God wants us to be servants. We want to be contented and joyful followers of Jesus, but then we pursue contentment and joy in ways that will never result in contentment and joy. 
See, see, this is something we've got to grasp. We are filling our lives with the wrong ingredients and wondering why we're not satisfied. And, and, and we believe God's promises, but we don't embrace God's principles. We, we, we say that we want the results of following Jesus, but then we don't follow Jesus with our lives. And, and then we get angry at God because our lives don't turn out the way we want. Why are you doing this to me? And how come it's not working out? Let me just tell you some things. Going to church is not going to make you happy. Okay? It's on the road, but just showing up here once a week and that's all you do spiritually, it's not going to result in contented life. Getting baptized is a great way to declare your faith in Christ. It's a great moment, but it's not the end of the journey. It's not going to bring contentment just because you do that. Following Jesus Christ means that you agree with God that His way is superior to your way. That his values and his plans and his uh, life on his terms is going to result in joy and doing it your own way is not. That's what's wrapped up in this submitting to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And when we follow Jesus that way, it results in contentment flowing into our lives, growing up in our lives. The Apostle Paul got this. In fact, he wanted Jesus more than anything. He wrote it in chapter 3, verse 8. You can flip back one page and you can hear him. He says this. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. He says, look, I'm willing to give up everything to know Jesus. I want more Jesus. Nothing else mattered to him. Now, are you interested in the secret recipe for contentment? Okay, thank you for that one person who answered yes. I'm going to preach this sermon for you. Everybody else can listen in, okay? Thank you for answering that. Because if not, we'll just close the book down and go home and go on with our frustrated lives. You see, it's not really a secret because throughout the letter of the Philippians, Paul told his friends how they could live this contented life, how they could get to that place where through Christ they can live a contented day-by-day life. And and so I'm going to share with you the ingredients for contentment. The ingredients for contentment because Paul just, he wrapped these up in this letter and, and as I was going back through this, I went, wow, he's just laying it out there. Here's the things that we've got to have as part of our life. And so here's what I want to do. I'm going to share these six things. I'm going to go fast. So, you know, they're in the notes. You can write them down and go back and look at them later. But here's what I really hope you'll do with this. I hope that you will look at your life and you will evaluate whether or not these are in your life. Are these in your pantry? Are you going to be able to go home and cook up a mess of contentment? Or are you going to be trying to satisfy your cravings the wrong way? So here we go. Uh, Number one, assurance. Assurance. Chapter 1, verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, I am sure of this. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He says, look, uh, if you know that you belong to God, then I know that God's going to finish that work in you. I'm sure of it. So do you know that you belong to God? Have you made that commitment to follow Jesus? Do you have assurance that heaven is your destiny? When I talk about assurance that heaven is your destiny, uh, it's the Christian hope that we have eternal life. But I don't want you to be like, well, I hope I make it to heaven, question mark. The hope that we have is that assurance, that promise that Jesus said, look, I'm going to take you to be with me, that where I am, you will always be. Is that hope living in your life? Do you know that you have had that life-changing experience with Jesus Christ? If so, then know that that relationship with Jesus is forever. Because if we are insecure in our relationship with God, we're never going to have that contentment that Paul is talking about. Do you know that God loves you? And do you love him back? How secure are you in your love relationship with Jesus? Assurance. we got to have it if we're going to be content. If you're living in fear contentment's never going to be there. The joy is never going to overtake your life. Settle that first and foremost. 
because it's an absolutely necessary ingredient. By the way, if you're not sure that you have that relationship with Jesus Christ, don't wait and don't wonder about it. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's God's promise to you. Right now, tune me out, tune him in, and, and you and God take care of that today. Second ingredient is purpose. Again, chapter 1, verse 21, the apostle says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul is certain that heaven is his destiny, so he can live a life of courageous purpose, a life of meaning and significance, a life that is focused on the mission of Christ. How about you? Are you advancing the kingdom of God or are you advancing your own kingdom? Are you thinking about representing Jesus throughout your day, throughout your day or are you just thinking about getting what you want? You see, I'm not talking about quitting your job and becoming a pastor or a missionary, although if God wants you to do that, you should definitely do it. What I'm talking about is, is deciding that God's kingdom is more important than what you want and being intentional about that day in and day out to represent Jesus to all the people that God sends your way. This is your purpose. This is the, the thing that God has called us to do because he's entrusted us with this responsibility to represent Jesus to a world that doesn't know Jesus. And it begins when you represent Jesus intentionally in your home. Are you being a godly husband? Are you being a godly wife? Are you being godly parents to your kids? That's where that responsibility begins. Are you intentionally doing that? Are you being those, those godly workers at your job? Are you being godly among your friends? Are you representing Jesus to the people that you come in contact with? Or are you just saying, hey, give me what I want? And here's the thing. The more that we focus our lives on, on being the person of Christ to the world, the more his purpose will flow into our lives and the more contentment's going to grow. When you're just focused on getting what you want, doing what you want, building up your kingdom, not going to be there. But here's the thing. It's not going to happen by accident. If you're going to have purpose, it has to be on purpose. So do you know your purpose? And are you making a difference? In the letter to the Ephesians, Paul said this, For you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Do you know what that means? That means that God has a to-do list for you and for me. And, and here's the thing. Your to-do list is just as important as mine. No matter what anybody else thinks, before God, your tasks, your people, the influence you have is just as significant as mine. You'll find your purpose as you dive into the things of God for your life. Third ingredient, serving. Chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. If you want to be joyful and content, then you can't make life all about you. And understand, the, the world is telling you, hey, if you're going to be happy, you got to do what makes you happy. If you're going to be happy, then you got to pursue your dreams, you got to do your stuff, and you got to make it all about you. Don't let anybody else get in your way. If you've got to trample them, even your family, you know, hey, you know, you can get another one. It's all about you, right? If you're not happy. Jesus tells us something completely counterintuitive. Paul tells us something completely the opposite of the world. He says, look, if you want to be content and you want to be joyful, serve others. Help others succeed. Make your life be about them. They're not more important than you. In fact, no one's more important than you in this world. Jesus came to this world to die for you, but no one is less important than you either. And if you'll elevate others, if you'll seek to help others be successful, then you're going to find contentment in the midst of that. Why? Because we have to kill our selfishness and pride if we're going to have joy in life. Right? Jesus said, if you're going to come after me, what do you have to do first? Deny yourself. Deny yourself. 
And this, this only happens as we take on the identity of a servant and we promote others ahead of ourselves. And it's difficult to do, but this is an absolutely essential ingredient to contentment. And this is a huge obstacle that gets in our way because we're just naturally selfish people. I mean, I know I am. And yet as we confront this, as we grow in, selfishness, uh, in serving and kill that selfishness, we're going to grow in contentment. Fourth ingredient, obedience. Chapter 2, verse 8, the Apostle Paul writes, And being found in human form, he, being Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus became obedient to the point of death. What's your obedient point? I mean, Jesus obeyed the Father. I mean, Jesus was God in the flesh, God the Son, and yet he obeyed the Father so that he could do the will of the Father and he could give salvation to me and you. That's what he did. He obeyed to the point of death, even death on the cross, so that we could be saved. He was serving us. But he obeyed the Father. What's your point of obedience? What are you willing to do for God. Now, most of us, honestly, are probably not going to have to be obedient to the point of death. Okay, in other words, we're not going to have to die for Christ. We live in a country where that doesn't happen a whole lot. And, and unless you travel someplace really, really unsafe, uh, where, you know, it's against the law to be a Christian, then you're probably not going to have to suffer and die for Christ. He's probably not going to call you to the obedient point of death. So we can talk about it all we want, and probably all of us will go, yeah, I'll die for Jesus if I have to. It's easy. But will you be inconvenienced for Jesus? Will you be obedient to the point of inconvenience right now in your life? Will you be obedient to the point of pain, to the point of sacrifice? You see, because here's my theory. Right now, the Holy Spirit is in you and he's in me if we're followers of Christ. And, and right now, he's kind of saying to, to you, because I know he's, what he's saying to me, hey, there's some things I'd like you to stop doing. We've talked about this before called conviction you know when you're doing it the holy spirit's showing up going hey hey then we talk about this this is bad for you there's some things that the holy spirit has been challenging you to do in your life obedience and you know what those are i know what those are for me you know what those are for you and the holy spirit is prompting you to take a further step of obedience to the point of sacrifice to the point of giving things up to the point of starting new habits and here's the reality. We want more contentment in our life. you got to have more obedience in your life. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. See, we want more Jesus. That means we obey more. Because joy and contentment are directly linked to obedience. And the little things matter. And, you know, and, and obedience is that point where we really find out if we mean what we say because we believe God's promises, but we don't want to live out God's principles. We want to take hold of the promises, and how many times do we claim the promises, and yet is our life living out God's principles? Because we're going to reap what we sow. Obedience. If you crave a contented life, then add more obedience. The fifth ingredient that we need is endurance. Chapter 3, verse 14, the apostle says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on. Life is hard, isn't it? I mean, we live in a broken, sinful world, and the temptation is always there to give up. Just to throw in the towel, say, you know, it's too hard, uh, I, I quit. And yet God calls us to endure. He uses those difficult times to teach us the character of Christ and to demonstrate his power to redeem our lives. And so often we quit before God has a chance to redeem. We give up before God gets to show the power of his blessings and we miss out on the contentment because we call it a day. Ah, I'm done. That's too hard. Uh, here's my story. Just share it with you a little bit. I've been pastor at Calvary for 23 years, 
and, and, uh, and, and let me just tell you something. I am content. I am delighted that I get to be the pastor of Calvary. Just went to the, to the uh, you know, uh, pastors and wives retreat down in Tucson. And I know that there's a lot of pastors in churches around the state that look at me and they're envious. Because they're like, man, I'd like to pastor a church like Calvary. And I go, yeah, it is awesome. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Because I'm, I'm pastor of the best church that I know. And, and, and it's just a joy and it's a privilege. But here's the thing. Years ago, in the early years, when I was pastoring here, I, I confess this now. There were a lot of times when, when you know, I'd be praying to God, something like this. God, get me out of here. These people are nuts. Some of them are mean. A bunch of them are crazy. Take me to some sane, loving, healthy church where, where the will of God can be done and we can just you know, celebrate his goodness. And God said, uh, Chad, they're all crazy. Why don't you just stay here? Be crazy with them. And I chose to endure. There were, there were times when I felt like throwing in the towel. There were times when I was like, this is too hard. This is too painful. This is too, you know, it's frustrating. And, and I chose to endure. And because I chose to endure and hang out, guess what? We get to celebrate like this. And, and I'm sitting in a place where I love what I do. And I love the people that I get to do it with. And I love this church. And that's what happens. That's what happens when we don't give up, when we don't give up on God, when we don't give up on our marriage, when we don't give up on our family, when we don't uh, give up on our integrity. God shows up, but we've got to make it to the other side of endurance. Can't quit. It's one of those necessary ingredients to contentment. Final ingredient. If you want to be content, you need generosity. 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 Pick up uh, Philippians 4, verse 14. I mean, we get so caught up in I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength that we kind of stop there and camp out. Paul goes on, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Kind of cool, isn't it? Paul's excited about them and he says, look, uh, and, and catch this in verse 17. This is so cool. He says, uh, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Literally, I seek the profit that accrues to your account. The profit that accrues to your account. Why? Because of generosity. Here's, here's what's happening in our souls. Uh, greed is this poison that infects our lives. It's a monster that lives inside of us. And it's, and it's a monster that, whose appetite never, ever goes away. And it's always wanting what? More. Yeah, you know, you're like me. You struggle with greed. Always want more. doesn't matter what it is. I want more stuff. I want more money. I want more. And, and, and we try to feed that greed because we think if we get more, we'll be happy. And yet that appetite is never satisfied and we're never content no matter how much we get. That's how greed poisons our soul. And the only way... The only way that we can, you know, cleanse our souls of this toxic waste called greed, the only way that we can kill this monster that is living inside of us is to give away the things that God has given to us. To give them away. To, to be generous. And, and, and as we step into generosity, as we give to God because God asks us to. Do you realize that's one of those points of obedience? is that we give to God out of gratitude and thanksgiving because everything we have is from Him. And so we give to God out of obedience and we give to other people in the name of Jesus to bless them. And as we do that, contentment grows in our life. Here's the deal. Because we're putting down those blessings, we're sharing them, and we're able to receive more from God. When you're holding on to that stuff, are you able to receive any blessings from God? No, but when you let go of it and you share it, your hands are open. And God can fill them again. And so in our lives, if we're not being generous, then we're, we're robbing ourselves of the joy and the contentment that God wants to offer us. 
Now, here's a tough thing, and I know this is true. We're sitting here, and we're talking about contentment, and every one of us is going, yeah, I need to be, I need to be more generous. I, I need to do that. I need to really get this. And yet, most of us think, if we're honest, at the depths of our souls, most of us think, hey, if I had more money, I'd be happy. If I won the lottery, I'd be happy. If someone left me a million dollars, I'd be happy. And God says, you don't get it. That's not the path to joy and contentment. That's the path to sorrow and heartbreak. We find joy and contentment when we can give generously. And then God rewards us in ways that a bank can never account for. So we desire to be contented, joyful followers of Jesus. What are you pursuing to get there? What do you really want more of? See, I pray that you're filling your life and your home with godly ingredients. After all, friends, it's me and you who are doing the shopping for our own souls. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the way that you love us, for the way that you are patient with us. Thank you for the way that you bless us. Give us the wisdom to hear your word. Let us tune in to the Spirit's voice today because you want to redeem our lives. You want to take us from that brokenness and that heartache to fullness and life and forgiveness and contentment. So God, speak into our lives even as we continue to worship you, even as we continue to thank you for your salvation, for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.